Aloha. Welcome to Finding Your Peace on the Rock on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Abe Lee. I have been a licensed real estate agent since 1973. I'm the owner of Century 21 High Properties Hawaii and work with 90 wonderful agents in real estate sales. I started Abe Lee Seminars in 1980. I've taught over 11,500 students to help them to get their real estate licenses. And I have taught thousands of agents every two years to continue their education and to renew their license. Our show is dedicated to helping buyers and sellers understand the process involved in a real estate transaction. Our special guests will talk about legal issues, escrow, title, getting a loan, surveys, home inspections, insurance contracts, wills and trusts, and much, much more. Today, we're honored to have Jim Merrill, now he says past president of Touchstone Properties, because he just retired, but they're not going to let him off the hook that easy, because they'll need him to make the transition smooth. So Jim is an expert in condominium association management, and I've known him for years and find him to be a wealth of knowledge. So I'm really honored to have him come back the second time to talk about a very important topic. Jim, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Thank you. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Okay. We're going to start on a topic that I think everybody that lives in condominium should be not worried about, but be concerned about. Because it started off, of course, with that Marco Polo fire. And so, Jim, can you tell us what happened? Okay. Um, just a little uh, background on me real quick. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, um, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I graduated from Ohio University, not Ohio State, Ohio University as a Bachelor of Science Electrical Engineering. So I am an electrical engineer. And in that was 69. And in 1982, I graduated from Pepperdine with a Master's in Business Administration. The following year, I got my real estate license, uh, the kind that uh, Abe was just talking about. He teaches a lot of people to get. And uh, in 1993, I went to work for Touchstone Properties. So I've been in property management for just a little more than 30 years now. Um, <clears throat> uh, what happened? Um, it, oh, I, I grew up in New Jersey. So I'm a transplant. And I came here to Hawaii in 1971, just two years after graduating from Ohio University. And I had a, a contract job. Actually, I, I worked for General Electric, who had a contract with the United States Navy. So my work environment was Pearl Harbor. Um, um, I had a few other jobs here before uh, getting my master's in business administration. I did that when I was working for Hawaiian Telephone. I worked for them for 10 years in facilities management, which is a great lead in becoming a property manager. I, we did manage Marco Polo from 2012 to 2014, a very short period of time in a building that was designed in the 60s and I think went into service. I think it got its building occupancy certificate in 71. So when I was there in 2012, it still had the original fire alarm. And I was working on a project with them to try to replace that fire alarm because uh, the modern fire alarms, you know, compared to what was designed in, in the 60s, it was like an old school bell system. And when uh, we did have a fire and many people came to the board meeting uh, uh, to say they never heard the alarm. And so we did a thorough, well, not we, you know, we hired a company to do a thorough inspection of the system and found out some of the bells weren't working and things like that. So it was it was time to replace that fire alarm. And uh, I we were removed as a managing agent uh, by an incoming, uh, well, well, by the, the by the board, you know, um, uh, and it was a it was a drive to reduce costs on every level. OK, by the board of directors. And that meant that they asked the fire alarm project that I had been working on. So that's just too bad because, you know, fire alarms are the early warning system. Get out of the building. There's a fire. Get out now. And the, the, one, of the, one of your questions, Abe, was how many people died in that fire. And there were four deaths in that fire. 
all from people who didn't get out of the building. And uh, it's believed that they all passed. I'm not a doctor, but I think they all passed from smoke inhalation um, before the fire ended up consuming them. Um, what the scope of damage, you know, it it's the fire started in one apartment. And you think about a concrete building, condos are very relatively safe buildings to be in. And, uh, you know, you close the door and you close the windows, you're surrounded by concrete, you know, and the fire is going to run out of oxygen and die out, uh, hopefully. And uh, the the occupant of this particular apartment left the apartment because it caught on fire and left the front door of the apartment open. And this caused the fire to spread into the hall uh, and into uh, apartments across the hall. And that is why uh, with about 16 apartments per floor, three floors were consumed. 48 apartments, either fire damage, smoke damage, or water damage from trying to put the fire out. And there are actually more apartments uh, than those three floors, or 48. You know, I think it was closing in on about 100 units that had some sort of damage uh, in that fire. Now, I saw the video in preparation for this uh, interview. And this, it started, what, on the 24th or 25th floor? Um, high sorry. up? What floor was it? Uh, uh, if it was, let's see. You're, you're right. It was pretty high up. I don't remember the floor it started on. Because I was going to, when I was there, the floor, uh, we had a fire on the eighth floor. Uh, and I was going to compare the two because, again, I know more about it because I was the property manager at the time. And the, the occupant's wife went downstairs from the eighth floor to the security guard desk and said there's a fire in my apartment so the the guy the the main security guard sent one of his guys up to go confirm it and he radioed down and said call 911 the apartment's on fire and then that security guard assisted the occupant who was what's the best way handicapped uh you know physically challenged helped him out of the apartment and then shut the door so basically, that apartment was consumed by fire. That fire was so hot. When I went in to inspect the next day, I said, what is that? And it, it, it actually, I had never seen a melted, melted refrigerator before. It, it just, it wasn't even six foot tall or five foot tall anymore. It was just melted. And that fire was that hot. It blew out the window and the heat going up from that fire melted the window frame on the apartment above it. So all of that stuff was going on in the 2017 fire, as you can see in the videos. You know, the fire is coming out of the windows. It's going up, and uh, and I, I know it's just melting the frames on the windows above it. But the, yeah, the difference between the, the 2013 fire and the 2017 fire was the apartment door was secured and uh, the apartment door was not secured in 2017. And um, from a condominium management standpoint, some very good takeaways from this, which was uh, when you put the committee in charge to redecorate the hall, go out and buy new carpet and new wallpaper, they spend a lot of time on which colors go with what. Um, and in the uh, case of the Marco Polo, uh, the carpeting in the hall uh, was not fireproof, nor was the wallpaper. So the once the fire got out into the hall, it shot right down the hall. Um, I remember was I was watching the fire on TV live when I saw smoke come out of the. Uh, if you were in the mountains, if looking towards the ocean, that side of the building. Smoke puffed out of the left-hand side of the building, which is the windward side. And I said, that shouldn't happen. And uh, somebody had propped open that door for ventilation. So, yeah, you had some, some functional things happen that really exacerbated the problem with the second fire. Yeah, And I suppose there wasn't enough training or people forgot what to do. 
in the event of an emergency like that? Okay, good good debate question because there there's a lot of um, poster fires. You know, you burn your toast, the smoke alarm goes off. You've got a lot of these, and you've got a 36 story building or 33 story building, and people, especially the aging community, they get tired of exiting the building, you know, and uh, and so they'll call up the security guy and say, "Is this for real? Do I have to leave?" And then that overloaded the phone system, and so the the operational standard was we don't answer the phone during an emergency. We've got work to do. You know, the the guards all had specific assignments to take uh, that they had to follow to help get people out of the building. Uh, Marco Polo did have a list of all of those people who needed assistance in leaving, so that was a good thing. And if uh, if Communities are listening to this, and you don't have one of those. You should have your resident manager get to work on one. I know that the damage was tremendous. So how did the association get the money, or who paid for the repairs to make this okay. building habitable? Good again? question. Great, great question. Okay, there's two insurances. So the association, through its board of directors, is required to purchase fire policy. Um, they're now called multi-peril policies. They cover fire, wind damage, and domestic water loss, okay? And so the multi-peril policy is going to kick in right away to rebuild the building as originally conveyed, okay? Well, as originally conveyed was 1971. So those homeowners were going to get press board cabinets and shag carpets and whatever was popular in 1971. <laughs> no, they wouldn't get shag, but they would get, you know, a basic standard carpet, basic standard drapes. So the good news is you're going to walk back into a brand new apartment. The bad news is you're going to say, well, where's my TV? Where are my clothes? All of that personal stuff that belongs in your apartment is, um, is covered by a homeowner's policy called an HO6. Homeowners 6, which is a condominium insurance policy. If you're a tenant, then you want a HO4, which is, that's going to cover the tenant's TV and the tenant's clothing and that kind of thing. So there's two resources or two sources of money coming in. The association's insurance that's going to rebuild it back to its original. And then the owner's insurance that's going to, uh, depending on how much they paid for. See, some of these HO6 policies, are, they've, they they will cover upgrades. So if you go in and renovate your apartment, you want to call your insurance company and make sure your renovations are covered. Otherwise, they're going to build it back to what it was in 1971 or whatever your building was born. Wow. So you really, you need two insurance policies. One is the HO604 for the homeowner. And then, of course, the association has their own policy. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah. So the association board of directors is required by the governing documents and law that, to get the building 100% replacement costs covered. And then, uh, again, you know, what's in the apartment uh, belongs to the homeowner. So you, you can't insure what you don't own. So that's why the homeowner has to go and insure their own contents. But that's an option for the owners and tenants. Uh, not always an that. option. It's uh, not always an option. There's now a law that says if the homeowners, more than 50% of the homeowners, this is since 2006, if more than 50% of the homeowners opt in to it, then everyone's required to have an HO6 policy. And oh, so- good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I, I think before it was an option, but now maybe not. Okay. And right. you know, we're halfway through this thing already, Jim. Can you imagine? So, uh -huh. Let's go to the other part, which is, What's the fire department requirement for building on building managers and owners to make sure that the building is safe? And what kind of steps are being taken? And what do the associations have to do to retrofit or renovate or do whatever? Right. So I think a, a lot of people have heard about the fire life safety evaluation, fire life safety evaluation. So these are done by engineering companies, uh, engineers who, you know, they might be electrical, they might be mechanical, but they've 
focused on this area of engineering, which is fire and fire safety. There's two reasons you want to do this for your building. One is the safety of the occupants, ingress and egress. Okay. How safe is the building for the occupants? Now, there's a fire. The occupants have to get out, egress. The fire department has to get in, ingress. And they want a safe and as safe as they, you know, they're going into the danger zone. They want as safe an environment to get in there as possible. So this fire life safety evaluation isn't just for the occupants of the building. It's, it's for the fire department as well, for the fire, uh, the safety of the firefighters. Okay, so it's very important. So what do they do? They go in and look at everything that you might have in your building with regard to fire. That would be the fire alarm panel, fire extinguishers, fire hoses, fire cabinets. What's the condition of the hoses? Had they been recently inspected, et cetera, et cetera? You get points for all of this. And this is all laid out in that ASHRAE documents um, and adopted by city and county of Honolulu through its building code. Okay, that's how, that's how it becomes law. And so do you, you hire an engineering company you, uh, to come in and do the report. They do the report. The fire department says you must submit that report by a certain date, which, by the way, I believe has already passed. So you should have done that already. Um, and, uh, and let's say you don't pass that fire safety evaluation. Well, there are going to be recommendations in it on what you need to do. Maybe you failed because the fire extinguishers weren't up to date or the hoses weren't up to date. Maybe you uh, had too many doors. Maybe you, your fire alarm is, is not up to date, which is pretty common because the new code you know, requires strobe lights and the ability to talk to people in the apartments and say, it's a toaster fire and, you know, uh, on the third floor. We got it under control already and nobody has to leave the building. Or you know, this is an actual emergency, get out now. So um, that's if you don't pass fire life safety, then you have to go out and ask your owners whether they want to opt out of sprinklers. If you have or decide to install a fire sprinkler system in your building, it kind of rules out your need to do fire life safety totally. So, but the, but opting out is the owner's decision. It's not the board of directors' decision. The owners have to be asked for whether they want to opt out. If they say no, well, then you should go down the road of getting a price to put in sprinklers and put them in because that that eliminates the fire life safety evaluation. So Does that make sense? In, yeah. So there's steps involved. One, you have to do a survey to see if what you have to do, and then the owners can opt to do or not do certain things. But what do they have to do? What, what can the fire department mandate a building to do? Well, they've already they already mandated that you have to have a fire safety, fire life safety evaluation if your your building is on their list. And they 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 created a list of I believe there was about 350 buildings in town that are not sprinklers. And so they said, okay, you guys have to do a fire life safety evaluation. And then uh you know, there's two ways of approaching it from a property management or board of directors standpoint is one is uh, if if we ask the owners and they don't want to opt out of sprinklers, that they want a sprinkler, we might as well just start planning for that right now, you know, because that eliminates the need to do a fire life safety evaluation. So I have a building that has 568 units, 567 units. And they did a fire safety evaluation, and it's looking like it's going to cost them about three million to five million dollars to meet the requirements of the fire life safety evaluation, raise the points to a passing grade. Okay, so let's say they spend that five million. They still have to go out and ask the owners if they want to opt out of sprinklers. So let's say they go and ask the owners. We want to opt out, and the owners say no. Well, you just spent three to five million on fire life safety, and now you're going to spend whatever millions of dollars to put in sprinklers. So, in some cases, it makes sense to just go to the owners first. You know, if they want sprinklers, put them in. 
avoid all the rest of the stuff. So you you were talking about the, the fire department. So we passed the a year, I think, when the fire life safety had to be in. And I think that there have been changes to this law. It was a 2018 ordinance, city and county ordinance. There was a 2019 change. There was a 2021 change, I believe, and a 2022 change. All of those changes simply just moved deadlines out because, you know, you might be looking at 5 to $10 million to put in sprinklers on a, a building that's already in place. So it's oh, big money. When can you not, when do you not have to put a sprinkler system in? And when do you have to put a sprinkler system in? What's the guideline? Okay. So if the people opt out of sprinklers, the owners, the majority of owners opt out of sprinklers, you don't have to put a sprinkler in. But other things come into play under that ordinance, which is you have to put up signs that say this building is not sprinklers. That, that's that's one that I, I you know just kind of sticks in my head. You gotta you gotta it's kind of like punishment, you know. Um, uh, a foot, by the way, Marco Polo, as I understand it, put a sprinkler system in after the fire was out. You know, so the people that didn't want to spend money uh, ended up spending millions of dollars to put to close the door after the fire was out. But it's good. Uh, to me, that's good. I mean, I'm not p putting that down. That, that's a great thing because now, you know, they, they can sleep at night, those people. And the fire department mandate that a building be sprinkler? The, the fire department doesn't mandate it. The county ordinance mandates it. So the fire department went to the city and county and said, we think every building should have a sprinkler system. Every building. And the city council uh, said no you know they got to be where you you're well i'm not sure what their their uh criteria was uh, one you, if you think about the the hook and ladder okay the tallest they can climb up to, and go into a building is about 70 to 75 feet so if your building's taller than that you should have a sprinkler system because otherwise our firemen if they don't have the elevator they're walking up the stairwells to come up and help you They've got only the equipment on their back, and your building might have dry standpipe. It might have wet standpipe. They've always got the hose in the hall, but it's not a lot. It, you know, it's good, but it's not a lot of firefighting equipment. Not the kind of same kind of thing you might have on the ground around a single story home. Boy, this gets really complicated and costly, doesn't it? Yeah, very fast. Yeah, costly, very fast. So. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you can't put a price on life. And yeah. four people died in that fire. And, and you know, that, that's really sad. Yeah. So, Jim, in your experience, I would say of the 350 buildings that were on the list, uh, how many of them have put in sprinkler systems? Do we know? Yeah. No, we don't. Because, first of all, they're not, I think I managed. Uh, 15, 20 of those buildings. So I, I could tell you about those. And um, uh, right now, one one of my buildings uh, that we manage that is a candidate for that has not asked its owners yet. But the, the original feedback we got from owners was they did not want to spend the money on a sprinkler system. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. they're opting to take a chance, a risk. Yeah, yeah. and they, 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 the reason I know this is they kind of filled the board meeting room right after, the you know the all the not hoopla but you know the publicity about the new law, uh, you know, and what the fire department was pushing for, and they came there to say we don't want that. Okay, I think they'd like to have a sprinkler if it didn't cost money. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so now, can the city building department mandate that buildings go and get sprinkler system? Well, uh, the building code already does mandate that you new buildings be installed with sprinklers. Right. So that's already there. This we're talking about retrofitting old buildings, okay? And we have, you know, the the big boom of condos was sixties and seventies. I mean, we've been building 
uh, or the the engineers have been and architects have been building and designing condos all along. But you know, there's been there's been area or times, as you know, because sales goes up, that there's a lot on the market and then there isn't, and then there's a lot more on the market and then there isn't. So um, we've got a lot of a lot of buildings that fall into the category of uh, school bell alarm systems uh, and uh, uh, no sprinklers. Amazing. You know, we only have uh, a little bit of time left, but what happens to the maintenance fees when they start opting to go into a sprinkler system? Right. So if if a building doesn't have sprinklers, then it's replacing them or adding them is not on your reserve study. You can't reserve for what you don't have. Okay. Um, in essence, you know, I'm putting quotes around that. But um, uh, so I lost my place. What was the how question? Much, what, how much is the maintenance fee going to go up if they have oh, yeah, yeah. the house? The building right so it's going to it's it's going to be a function of a number of things so if you're an apartment a condo owner right now you got to say to yourself how many units in this building okay so there's a hundred right then it pretty much it's going to be split a hundred ways so if it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars it's a thousand bucks each it's not by the way it's going to be in the millions but you know that that's pretty much what you can do now there are some condominiums where everybody has the same percent of common interest. And there are Marco Polo, Abe, you're going to love this one, over 50 different PCIs. That's mean 50 different floor plan layouts at the Marco Polo. Yeah. So you might have, you know, you might have to put in a thousand and the guy upstairs has to put in 20,000. You know, it's just that radical, you know, I mean, I, I crazy, but it, that what happens to the maintenance fees? You know, when costs go up, the maintenance fees go up. That's all there is to it. And now, how do the owners fund this new cost? Hey, let's say you were required to put sprinklers in, and you decided the owners decided they wanted to do it now. There's only two ways to fund that. A loan or a special assessment, a loan or a special assessment. So either the people are all going to fork up big checks based on their PCI, or you're going to go to a bank. And then next year, when the loan payments start, you know, everybody's maintenance fees goes up. So, Jim, I wish we had more time. But Me too. Uh, <laughs> but we're out of time right now. I got the warning saying, stop. <laughs> but thank you so much for your expertise. I know it's a very complicated process, but really the potential buyers and the current owners really need to keep on top, top of what's happening with the association and the uh, engineering firms and the contractors and all this other good stuff. But thank you so much, Jim. Really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thanks, Dave. All right. Enjoy your retirement. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank Folks, you. Watch the video and talk to your association, management company, and of course, your board of directors, etc. And if you want more information, we are on the archives under Think Tech Hawaii, Finding Your Piece of the Rock. And if you want to know more about real estate and the school, then go to ableseminars.com. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful week. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. 
If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.